Welcome. Thanks for sticking around. I'll get a snack for you. <laughs> 45 minutes was enough time to be like, ah, oh, let's get the play. Um, so, to kick things off today, uh, first, I am Jared Novak. Um, if you want to find me on Twitter, GitHub, pretty much everywhere else, I am at Jared Nova. Um, so, I'm coming here today from Upstatement. Uh, we are a company based here in Boston specializing in web design. We work out of a beautiful office in South Boston, like the Seaport District. A big, spacious, awesome place to come into work every day, five minutes from South Station. Uh, and the reason that I am emphasizing that so much is that we are definitely hiring. So check out our jobs page at upstatement.com slash jobs. So at Upstatement, we specialize in web design for media companies, specifically publications. So this is just a small sample of some of the work we've done. Uh, work with clients like NPR. In 2011, we did the responsive redesign for bostonglobe.com. And uh, another site we did this year is for the Harvard Law Review. So I'm going to use the Harvard Law Review today as uh, kind of a case study and go all the way through some things about design and technology because it's a site we built entirely in WordPress. So today we are going to go through some of the essential tools to building a publication inside of WordPress. So this is going to cover kind of a mix of things. Um, everything from design and how it affects readers, um, the build and technology behind the sites, and then also the actual management and content that goes in here um, for the editors and the writers who have to populate these sites with actual content. Um, so to kick things off, I'm going to start with design and talk about tool number one that I've, I've really come to learn and appreciate on the design side. And that is to steal ideas. <laughs> and in terms of stealing, a great place to steal them is right from print. So um, before I started up statement with some of my uh, partners, the way we all met each other um, was in the newspaper business. We all worked at the Daily Orange, which is the student newspaper at Syracuse University. Early in our careers, we were everywhere from uh, here in Boston to the Globe. Uh, I used to work at Houston Chronicle. My friend was all the way on the West Coast at the Merck News. Um, so we've been over, and, and these are some of the papers that uh, we and our employees have worked at. And it turns out that there are a lot of great ideas that are still uh, being done every day in the print world that have yet to make their way over to the web world. One of the things we do when we start a project um, that has like a print component, like you know, translating a magazine or a newspaper onto the web, is we, we make sure we get our hands on the actual hard copies of what this publication is like. So we just started about a month and a half ago working with a newspaper um, in the Midwest. So right now every day we get a mailed subscription to the office of that day's paper so we can see what's going on, how are they reacting to news, what are some of the different ideas that they are currently doing in the newsroom with their actual content that we might be able to steal and bring over to the web? Um, great thing about print is it's been along for a long time. And because of that, there's a lot of history and a lot of conventions that we can take advantage of. So for this particular project, they have a 100-page style guide behind different types of story forms they use. Story forms are an idea that we've picked up in newspapers, but I've yet to really see done in a big way on the web. Story form is the idea that instead of just saying headline and then content here, wait a second, you can do all types of different things with the content here part. So the newsroom that we're working with is already doing a ton of things in that space, so we're going to be taking a lot of those ideas that they're already doing and figuring out ways that we can bring them to the web in a really sensible way. So when it came time to work on the Harvard Law Review project starting about a year ago, we made sure to get our hands on uh, about a year's worth of copies um, of the publication. One of the things we noticed, one of the challenges we knew we were going to have, is that every single issue looks pretty much the same. Every uh, issue, there are 10 issues a year, the cover is the logo along with a table of contents highlighting what's inside. And this has been the case going back a long, long time. We also got a copy from 1931, 
And as you can see, it hasn't changed a whole lot. They added the box around uh, Harvard Law Review in like the 50s. That was the big design animation. And the reason that this is important is because the change of that cover signals to readers, hey, there's something new in here. The way you get that information now is because a new one of these ends up in your mailbox. But when it comes to the web, we need to figure out some way to tell people, hey, you just got to the homepage and there's something new here. So the way that a lot of publications do this, like the New York Times, is that lead image, that lead photo, changes a dozen times a day, at least. They have some slightly different layouts to deal with different types of news, but visually, you've got an image there to say, yes, there is something new right now going on. This is great for the New York Times where they have staff of, no doubt, like hundreds of photographers and freelancers out there. In the case of the Harvard Law Review, they've been around for 127 years, and in that 127 years have used zero photos. So we've got to figure out a different way to tell people there's new stuff here. Magazines have another convention where you've got big, splashy, illustrated covers, right? The thing is, with really cool covers, is that it takes a budget to actually hire an illustrator. It also takes a really good art director to lead them to, hey, here's the main stuff going on here. This is what we need to somehow illustrate or communicate. Not always easy and definitely not cheap. So looking at the print world, there are actually a lot of ways that um, printed publications use to signal people this is something different, this is something unique, even if it's part of the same series. Um, I don't know if anyone here as a developer might be familiar with A Book Apart, which is the series from the Alist Apart, Event Apart people. So they put out uh, about four or five of these books every year. Same essential design on every cover. They just use a big, different, splashy color to signify, okay, this is the HTML5 book. The yellow book, oh, that's the responsive design book. Uh, the blue book is content strategy, and, and that helps signal to you, okay, that's a unique, different book. Um, a series that's been doing this for years and years and years and years is O'Reilly and their like um, animal series, right? So I'm sure you've seen these. You've got the butterfly for JavaScript because, I don't know, because it's elegant and light and powerful. You've got a koala for HTML because you've got a koala for HTML. It doesn't really matter why. It just is what it is. And it tells you, okay, this one is different besides just the text. So this is a really good idea we wanted to bring over, but it doesn't mean that it's automatic. It takes a little bit of thought. Another series that I found that does something similar is called Rocks, W-R-O-X. It's another series of computer books. And maybe they saw this and were like, oh, great, I know what we'll do. We'll get a cover photo of the authors and put it right out there on the cover. So the thing is, um, <laughs> it has to be handled right. <laughs> I love visual C-sharp guy with the sunglasses. <laughs> you know, there was like a 30-minute argument with the photographer. It was like, please, sir, will you please take off those sunglasses? And I was like, nope, it's not going to happen. So anyway. Underlying all of this is we needed to make sure that the design itself worked uh, without any flourishes. So this is the home page of the Harvard Law Review, kind of naked. And what we figured out is we could use that background and use that to tell people, okay, this is um, a way of tying new content to image. So we have these different background splashes that occur. And when there's new content, when there's new stuff available from the home page, they change out the copy, but they also change out that background image. It's light, it's subtle, but it still kind of fits into the character of the brand. And these aren't just applied randomly. What happens is when an editor creates an issue, and this is like an issue landing page, they pick that background image, and there are about 50 that they can choose from. And then as you go into one of those stories, that story will share the same background. So it kind of helps keep things uh, from just randomly changing with every page. So one of the things that was really important in designing this is actually kind of having an understanding of what it's like to read the Harvard Law Review. Has anyone here ever read a Law Review article? Oh my god. I thought like one hand would go up. All right. Well, we have a policy at Upstatement where when we're doing one of these publications, um, step one is always to actually 
read it. Figure out what it's like um, and put, um, it gives you empathy with the readers and what they're working with. And these are very, very dense issues. These run uh, into the thousands of pages. And what this made us think about is, okay, when we're kind of experiencing this publication, what is the primary activity? And in the case of the Harvard Law Review, we said, okay, the primary activity that you're doing with this text is you are reading. This might seem really obvious, but when it comes to publications, reading is not always the sole purpose or the only goal. Let's take the New York Times again, for example. It might seem like, oh, of course, it's a newspaper, you read it. But with newspapers, there's a style of reading where you, know, you have like the inverted pyramid style of writing an article, where the top has all of the important information, and as you go deeper, it gets less important and less important. Same thing with like homepage. This is actually a piece of content in itself. You get the headlines, you get a sense of what's going on in the Ukraine or ISIS just from the headlines and the decades. Those are like uh, the extended intros. You don't actually have to click these stories. So I would say a major activity here is scanning. So going a little further, let's think about maybe something like BuzzFeed. For an article like this, it's hard to say that reading is really the primary goal. Um, it's more really almost just like kind of scrolling and absorbing, um, doing it whatever it is you do with GIFs. That's what you do on BuzzFeed. When it comes to a site like Reddit, you know, they build themselves as a publication uh, produced by Condé Nast, which is a huge magazine publisher. I would say here the primary activity is maybe it's, you know, interacting, commenting, upvoting, all the things that kind of go on in the Reddit community. Um, if anyone here has ever been on a site called Facebook, you've probably <laughs> accidentally clicked on a link that found you at this site, Upworthy. Here, I would say the primary activity is actually sharing. That's what they really are trying to drive you towards. It's how the headlines are written. It encourages that sharing. Uh, right underneath the headline are three big, bold buttons to post this to Facebook or Twitter. For some other things, like let's take a alumni newsletter of a college. Like here's the Syracuse one. Is this really about reading the articles? I think the big purpose here is to actually tell the people who are viewing this, here's what we're doing with your money. <laughs> Maybe give us more. Um, for like a nonprofit or a charity, like here's the March of Dimes site, if you look at the text, it's actually really, really difficult to read. Uh, I don't think they really care whether you read it or not, frankly. Um, if you look around their site or in their news section, the big activity they really seem to be uh, driving towards with the publication is to just mention corporate sponsors. Perfectly valid. It's just what it's there to do. So one of the things we identified with HLR is that major, major activity besides reading it on the screen was actually printing it out. Uh, the target market for the law review uh, is people like this. Not necessarily sitting Supreme Court justices, but maybe people of this age demographic. I can assure you Antonin Scalia does not cuddle up at night with his iPad and read the Harvard Law Review. What probably happens is his clerk will find an article that is of relevance, print it out for him, and fax it over to his chambers. And yes, the faxing is huge at the Supreme Court. I, I learned that. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the reading experience from uh, printing out pages was going to have the same high quality um, uh, visuals that you would get on screen because we knew this was going to be a major way that their audience was going to consume content. Alright, so that's a little bit about the design. Let's move into actually building this thing out. So, a tool that we used here to make this as easy as possible and translate that great design into HTML and WordPress world. Uh, it's something called a template language. So I want to introduce you to another member of the Upstatement team. Um, and this is Tito. Tito is one of my co-founders. We've been working together since 2002 at the student newspaper in Syracuse. Brilliant, brilliant designer. Um, 
one of the things that makes him so strong is that he makes sure he carries through his design vision all the way from kind of research and strategy to making comps in Photoshop or InDesign, as well as going into HTML. And when it comes to actually building an HTML, it's really tough for me to give him a file like this. This is a content.php file from the WordPress 2014 theme. It's really tough for me to turn this over to Tito and say, okay, go nuts, build it out. Um, because as you can see, it's a mix of kind of WordPress ease and PHP and stuff like that. There are PHP tags all over, there are function calls, there are if statements, there are else statements, you're sending HTML through different functions. Maybe you're a WordPress development expert, you know exactly what's going on here, but it's very difficult to translate this um, to people who might be fluent in design and HTML. So at Upstatement, we created a tool, um, it's actually a plugin for WordPress, and it's called Timber. And what Timber lets us do is unlock what's going on inside WordPress and allow our designers to write HTML and allow someone like me, who's a WordPress developer, to very easily add the variables that have that connect with WordPress and boom, there's the website. Um, Timber uses the Twig template language for those of you who that means something to. Um, I want to explain in a second about what that means and then show an example. So a template language works like this. It says, okay, first, let's start off with the markup. And that is basically you know, the HTML that you're working with to build an individual web page. It then says, I need you to go through and tell me what is a variable. In other words, they're part of that web page or of that markup that's going to stay the same, you know, a div tag or a menu tag or something like that. Uh, sorry, a nav tag. Um, and there are parts that are going to change, like the actual content of that headline or the actual makeup of that menu. So once you do that, Tibber and Twig say, okay, thank you. I can now assemble those two together. You've given me the markup. I now have the data from WordPress. I'm going to put them together and serve them to users when they come to the site. So in terms of the process of what this looks like with Tito and I, he would give me some markup that maybe looked like this. So let's just pretend for a second that on the author profiles they wanted to list their favorite cases or Supreme Court justices. So this is the basic kind of dummy markup for something like that, where we've got a mini headline in H3 and then an ordered list with some different justices in it. So if I were to take the normal PHP route, I would say, okay, thank you for your work. I'm going to start copying and pasting this and move it into something that looks like this. We've got HTML. We also are echoing out some variables, uh, going into PHP and doing a for each loop over an array. This isn't too terribly complicated, but as the site grows, it can become very, very difficult to manage. And when Tito wants to make a change, he might look at this and say, I don't know what the hell is going on. So let's go back to his markup. So again, okay, we've got favorite justices, we've got a little list, uh, we've got a variable that um, for the ID of the list. What Twig lets me do is say, okay, let's now go in and add some variables. So that favorite justices, that comes from the CMS, and let's just say that's a custom field called list underscore type. So I'm going to fill that in. Now, with the list, it's a little more complicated because they might list one person, they might list two people, they might list 12 people, they might list 20. This is where I need to employ something like a loop. Twig makes this really easy, I think with a beautiful syntax. So here we have four justice in justices, and it outputs justice. So it's not too terribly different from the PHP world. But there's a lot less typing, there's a lot less opportunity for error. And what's great is that when it comes to sharing this with the design staff at Upstatement, this looks to them a lot like HTML. It's a lot less scary than PHP quotes and PHP question marks floating around. So at Upstatement, we're able to work together on a ratio of like three designers to one developer because they're able to do so much more inside of their HTML and Twig files in terms of connecting it to WordPress. So just as another small example, um, 
one of the cool things on the site is that there are these very kind of um, involved footnotes where you can uh, see them on the side when the screen is wide or in mobile or tablet mode and they kind of appear as a hidden uh, diff that gets triggered. This is something that took Tito a lot of trial and error to get right. <coughs> rather than locking that into a, or sorry, rather than locking that into PHP, I was able to create a twig file for him. And he was able to update, modify that as much as he needed, get that working with the CSS, classing it right, putting the right number of wrappers around it, um, without having to worry about breaking the entire site because he forgot a semicolon. So I just want to show one quick example of how we, we can put this into use really quickly. So this might be the way you display um, the featured image or the thumbnail on a post. So what WordPress asks you to do is first, we're going to get the ID of the current post, pass that to a function called the get underscore post thumbnail ID. That's going to return the ID of the thumbnail for the post. We pass that ID to another function that's called WP Get Attachment URL. That's going to actually generate or find the URL of that particular thumbnail, assign that to a variable. Then we can go into HTML world and say, okay, image source, and then echo out that URL. This is not too, too terribly complicated, but doing this hundreds and hundreds of times over the course of a single site, let alone a year's worth of projects, is a lot of work. What's especially tough is sometimes things like this, if you go into a commercial theme or even like um, one of the open source ones, is sometimes this HTML is buried inside of other files. So for 2014, this is buried inside of a file called template tags.php or something, a function called 2014 post thumbnail. And you can see inside of here, there's like different HTML, different logic going on. It takes a lot to understand this. <coughs> So what Timber lets us do is when Tito hands off to me markup that looks like this and says, okay, Jared, this is the kind of um, markup this needs to reflect, I can go into this and say, oh, well, this is pretty easy. I'm just going to get rid of that and say post.thumbnail.source. And that's going to output the source of a thumbnail. Something I really love about this is that when he looks at it and says, well, it's great, but we need those all resized to uh, 100 by 100, it's like, oh, okay. Let's add something called a filter, resize to 100 by 100. I can save that, I can push that to our staging site, I can even turn that back over to Tito. And maybe Tito was tweaking the design late one night, and he's like, you know what, these square thumbnails just aren't working. It's a really, really transparent language for him to come in and say, you know what, if we make this 200 by 100, that's a lot nicer. So it really kind of helps open up our process so that the developers don't have to be, like me, don't have to be little cave dwellers who refuse any change. It really helps make sure that the design grows kind of organically as the site grows. So we've now built a beautiful website for ourselves. There's one really important piece that's missing, and that's actually managing the content that's going to go into the site. So, something I believe for a long time is that editors are users too. The people who actually have to populate the site are as important as the people who read the site. And I feel like that's become a little like buzzwordy over the last few years. And why I think that's so important is because basically every minute that you have a very trained, very skilled writer futzing with a crappy interface, that's one less minute that they're not spending on crafting a great headline or finding the perfect photo for their content. Now luckily, WordPress starts us off pretty good in this regard. The main post-editing screen, I didn't know this until recently, but uh, a few years ago at version 2.7 or 2.8, um, they actually did eye tracking studies to figure out the best way to lay out this screen. And that's something that WordPress did that a lot of other open source CMSs never bothered with. And it made things a lot better. And I think that's why we're here at WordCamp instead of Expression Engine Camp or something else. 
That said, even though this starts us pretty good, I've never done a project where I've turned the screen over. And they said, great, there's a headline, there's body copy, I can add tags and maybe a category or two. Done. Go home, nothing else to do. Instead, almost every site has these very kind of unique content needs depending on the publication. In the case of the Law Review, some of those things were, many articles were associated with specific cases they needed to reference. Um, for citation, they needed to provide the exact page number uh, and issue information for where it appeared in the print publication. When it came to things like book reviews, they wanted to have you know, an image of the book cover, um, a link to Amazon, a title, and other data about that book. So let's take a typical Harvard Law Review editor, like this guy. <laughs> so back in the, uh, I think, 1989 to 1990 season, uh, Barack Obama was the editor of the Harvard Law Review. So let's work with Barack a little bit on the kinds of ways he needs to get this content into the CMS. So first of all, I am not comfortable turning over a CMS that looks something like this to an editor. Um, Drupal has not done all of the hard work to necessarily organize the information that is going to be specific. But before we just kind of dance on that grave, uh, when it comes to <laughs> WordPress, the default way of getting custom data, custom fields into WordPress is not really any better. They give you a weird kind of drop down with all the custom fields that are available, and then you're supposed to put in the value over on the right hand side. So, a tool that I've gotten a lot, a lot, a lot of mileage out of to making this better is called Advanced Custom Fields. And there are a lot of custom field plugins out there. This is the one that I've personally fallen in love with. Um, I've been using it for a few years since version 3. Uh, he recently released a version 5 about a month or so ago that is even better than everything that before it. Uh, worked a little bit as a beta tester and got a few lines of code in the final version, which I'm pretty proud of. So one of the things that ACF lets you do, um, for Harvard Law Review, we needed to make related stories very easy. So if you're reading an article about, um, let's say it's something about Citizens United, it's able to link off to other commentary or other cases in that same vein. So this lets me show off my favorite field, or one of my favorite fields, called the relationship. So the way you might do this in traditional bare-bones WordPress would be something like this, where, okay, you've got a custom field for related IDs, and then as the value, we're going to put in a comma-separated list of, oh, this article relates to article ID number 341 and 1632 and 7234. Obviously, not very user-friendly. So to show you what ACF lets us do, Start at the home page. Right, so now we're into an actual article. This is what the related box looks like to a reader. An editor is able to go into the post edit screen, and down here you can see there's the FTC case that was referenced. You can pull stuff over from this left list. The right side is what is actually on the page, the left side is like the browser. You can search for something, add it drag and drop it into the right place. And whenever we introduce this to the client, they say, oh my god, it's drag and drop? Like, how, how did you do that? And it's like, well, that took like 30 seconds. It's just an option. Um, and there's the result on the front end. So really, really simple, really, really beautiful way for editors of getting and finding the related stories that belong with an article. Something I love about ACF is that even with some of the basic stuff, you don't even have to be relating complex uh, articles to each other. It does that really well. So, on a normal article page, we've got the headline, the criminal court, um, but we also have another field, and that is a subhead. And for whatever reason, the WordPress gods never decided that a subheadline should be a part of the CMS. One of the things that ACF lets you do, instead of just adding this weird, like, custom field box all the way at the bottom of an article, I can actually target where on the screen my custom fields are going to go. So in the case of a subhead, well naturally it belongs 
underneath the headline, but before the body content, just as it appears to a reader. Another case that we had to deal with is, okay, we need custom fields, um, but only sometimes. So remember, uh, I mentioned earlier, custom type or custom data we had to deal with was like book review content. So we want these fields available, but we don't want them everywhere. We only want them when it's an actual book review. So this is the advanced custom fields interface for building out these fields. So this is like the book review module. And what I'm telling it is using this rule set down here. I only want you to appear when the post category is equal to a book note or, excuse me, when the book category, sorry, post category is equal to a book review. So back on a post edit screen, we scroll to this kind of custom zone down here. Oh, we go back. So, a second ago, I should stop here. Hold up. So nothing's there, click book review, and that set of fields appears. So that way we're not overwhelming the editors with all of these options that might not apply to them. It can actually intelligently react based on the options that uh, an editor has set up. So now we add like a cover, a little bit of data to it. Update. And then on the front end of things, over there on the left, we got our little kind of book stack. Something I love about ACF is that it lets you make your own fields. So this actually means you can do things, uh, create different interfaces that they've never done before. So let's go back to these backgrounds, right? So we've got 50 different backgrounds that an editor can choose from. I want to give them a really simple, beautiful, and intelligent way to do that. So I thought, what is more simple and what is more elegant than a beautiful bulleted list <laughs> that lets someone choose? Exactly. You can background three orange splotches. It's perfectly clear to readers what they're getting. All right, for real, when someone creates a issue, what we did is created this picture browser lets them very easily see what is available and then choose which background is captures the mood of that issue. This isn't a field built into ACF. This is something that we were able to put together really quickly um, because the developer provides this like starter kit for building your own fields. Building that took about an hour, hour and a half. That's it. A quick bonus tool I want to show real quick. Um, something we have called zone board. So let's take the default WordPress dashboard, right? You've got the valuable stuff you need uh, properly organized over on the left, kind of 5% of the screen. And then 95% of the screen dedicated to the really important stuff like WordPress news, quick draft, uh, and other stuff that everyone ignores. So thinking about our typical Harvard Law Review editor, the thing is, at uh, the Law Review, everyone serves one term. So every year there is complete staff turnover. So you can imagine that in between those years, a lot of institutional knowledge is gained and then lost. Gained and then lost. So we did training with a staff that in about another five months is going to be gone. So it was really important that some of the deeper functions that are maybe, oh, well, to create an issue, 
because that's a type of taxonomy that's under posts and that's very deep in the site. But yet, that's a common task that someone is going to have. So, what Zone Board lets us do is bring all that stuff to the top level. We can organize these custom blocks and say, oh, you want to do something with issues? Well, maybe you want to edit an issue or create an issue or manage an issue. We can group that in one custom place. We can also link offsite to things like um, uh, submissions come through another service, submissions to the publication come through another service outside of WordPress. Well, we can just link offsite. Um, the fact that is coming somewhere else, an editor honestly doesn't really care. So this has really helped them kind of maintain that institutional knowledge over the generations of editors. Um, so zone board, if you're interested, we, I just open sourced it last night on GitHub, um, upstatement or GitHub.com slash upstatement slash zone board. Works with just a simple configuration JSON file where you lay out what kind of icon you want, uh, the link, and then the title of that link. So to recap real quick, uh, upstatement.com slash HLR for everything about uh, the project. Upstatement.com slash timber for the timber plugin. That's what lets you write HTML with WordPress better. Advancedcustomfields.com. And then finally, upstatement.com slash zoneboard, and that'll just bounce you straight to the GitHub page if you're interested in trying out uh, zoneboard for one of your sites. And that is the end. So you raise your hand. Yeah, um, how did you go about preventing editors from reusing uh, the same backgrounds within you know, so much of an issue that already used it? Um, there's no de explicit device right now where it was like, oh, warning, you use this yeah. in May and it's maybe October. I think we just kind of counted on a little bit of intelligence. That said, you know, feeding, that would be a feature where it's like, okay, let's just spend a little data and add like a tick every time it's used or something. Uh, looking again at that back end there with the dashboard that you're, you're installing in so many different users, mm -hmm. uh, is there a way that you can kind of get rid of those blocks and only put in the blocks that you want to show? Uh, my experience has been that those will user configure, configurable, so depending on the browser that your user is looking at, yeah. they're, they're going to save them for them, but I haven't figured out a way to control what they're saying. Sure. That's something that would definitely be like a, uh, something that we've thought about and talked about in terms of like a next step. Not something that's built into it right now, but definitely kind of like number one role space configurations where it's like, you're the lead editor, I may be like a copy editor, so you need different options, I need different options. Um, and then, okay, well, you know, you're, I'm Jared, you're Alan. Uh, you want different layout, different configurations, so being able to drag and drop in a similar way that you can do other stuff in the WordPress interface. Um, hopefully, if I do this talk in six months, I'll be able to say, yes, you can definitely do that. Over there on the edge. Is the uh, Timber plugin working the same as the uh, like Shopify theme framework? Like, are we going to have template system? It looks pretty similar. Uh, so the question was about whether the Timber plugin is the same as the uh, well, yeah, it looks like Liquid. The same. So is, that, is it like a similar system? Like it's like 95% the yeah. same. Liquid and Timber both, or Twig both share like a common ancestor yeah, yeah. on the template language tree of life. So you can, you can basically use it in a similar way when you're creating your uh, WordPress HTML instead of, uh, instead of having like all the PHP within, uh, within those files, you can use those uh, Liquid work with Timber template instead? Yeah, exactly. Probably might be some differences in the syntax, but very, very, very similar. What well, uh, sort of plugins do you Uh, so the question was about what plugins I use for SEO and, um, sorry, was it? Or, or services, SEO and um, analytics, user tracking. So that's not like a core uh, competency of mine, I would say, in terms of SEO. Like the Yoast plugin does, I was, it used to be resistant to using it, and then I used it again for the first time like a month ago, and I was like, oh, this is really good, actually. Um, so that's a great interface. We're able to get the data out of it really easily. My overall SEO approach has been, you know, fast speeds, well-constructed pages that validate. Um, beyond that, I'm not very well-versed, I'll confess. So, uh, does your customer 
now use the output of what you have done for the print publication, or are they still doing something in parallel? So the print publication has not yet been affected here. Um, they still publish that with whatever system they used before. This is a separate track. I mean, overall, they recognize that 10 years down the line, whereas now the print publication is more important than the web to them based on their audience, that's going to start to change, or not start to change, but continue to change over the next few years. In the back? Um, your print style sheet. Yeah. Uh, how many browsers back did you try to support mm -hmm. for that? That sure. look. So the question was, how far back do we get the print style sheets to apply? Um, luckily, with the print style sheets, um, they're very forgiving. We went back, I believe, as far as IE7, but I can't remember exactly. But I think it was IE7. What's up? Um, so, number one, you're a great presenter. I really appreciate your style. Thank you. Um, so, um, I'm on a small, hyper local news site, and mm -hmm. you've worked with a number of news sites. So, I'm just wondering, you know, What's your nice, your best piece of free advice you can give a small guy like me, having done so many uh, media websites? Sure. So the question was about free advice for a media website. But free, free was the question. Okay. Uh, I don't have a good off the top answer. My best. Is, is just in terms of mindset. Um, try to be a user every single day. Um, try to observe yourself when you're using other things and what frustrates you. I keep a pad um, like on my desktop of like little things on the web that annoy me and just kind of keep adding to that. And then when I'm doing something, I'll sometimes look at that and be like, well, wait a second, I'm doing what I hate. Um, that's, that's the best I can come up with right now. Maybe I'll email you in like an hour with this month long. Next year when I'm pulling down with G's, I'll argue this. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I'll put that. I have a question about Timber. Mm -hmm. Does Timber replace all PHP in the PHP file or just the loop functions or some other subset? Sure, the question was about whether Timber replaces the PHP or whether it's just the loop functions. The idea is that um, you tell Timber when you want to start using Timber. So you would, if you install the plugin today on your site, nothing would change. What would happen is you would open up a PHP file and you would say, okay, at this point, look, I've got this data object that contains maybe your post object. I want to send that to Timber and write a file. So you would make a call. Um, probably easiest is to show it. Over here, you would say, hey, I want to use single top, single dot twig. Here's the data I'm sending over to it. And then over here, this is a single dot twig file. This is where you can safely write that markup. So what we do with most projects is I will create as many twig files as needed, turn those over to the designers and say, go nuts. Uh, have it happen. And then the PHP file, that's where I work. And I'm doing stuff like, okay, we need to find the most recent stories, excluding stories that have been featured in the homepage in the last three days, you know, that kind of complex logic, separating that stuff so they can worry just about how it displays, and I worry just about how the data is transformed and manipulated. This is something that is translated on the fly and when the page is requested? Yeah, so um, asking about what, when this happens, um, and this does happen on the fly. That said, there are like a bunch of different caching options so that you don't have to do that. One of the nice things though is it all compiles to PHP in the background. So if you actually open up like a cached file, you can see these two things kind of mash together in the ugliest way possible. <coughs> Super ugly, but it's also really efficient for the PHP processor compiler. It's time for one more. One more. All the way in the back. You were showing the book covers, and I missed how those images got into the WordPress. The book covers. So the, you're talking about like the... Um, For the book reviews. Oh, sorry. So that is just through kind of the standard WordPress uploader. Um, so the editor had to go find the image and crop it and upload it? Yeah, no, nothing fancy there. You know, usually it just means going to Amazon and right-clicking. <laughs> Yeah, 
yeah, just this one. It's just pulling it from the uh, from the media library and attaching it. Didn't do it. No. So, I guess that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, real quick, again, we are hiring at Upstatement. Awesome. Um, there you go. We are hiring at Upstatement. Upstatement.com/jobs. I also have tons of stickers up here, so please come by and pick one up. And thank you for staying late and coming today.